happy to uh, get the opportunity to sit in conversation with you all. Uh, my name is Carla Aguilar, and I'm a member of the Tepeyan Pohutec Nation um, as, a, as a part of the Alteca Paguame uh, group of families. And I, I, I commit to seeing through um, a just and fair treatment of the ancestors at Mission San Antonio de Valero and all of the missions, and, and for all of those ones that um, have been written out of history one way or another. Uh, there's a great deal of um, heartfelt frustration um, at the processes that have been carried out by, by the Alamo Trust and the City of San Antonio General Land Office and all of the different players that are involved in all of this. And so uh, part of our work as, as a tribal community is to create conversations about these important issues in a way that is um, understandable and usable for people. So uh, we, we get asked uh, all sorts of questions about, uh, well, what's, what's really going on with the Alamo? And so our, our hope for this evening uh, was to be able to bring together uh, several different uh, folks who are uh, involved in from from different communities representing different communities or um, that are uh, impacted that are being negatively impacted by um, the the operations of the Alamo Trust, uh, which has uh, set a trajectory um, based off of the initial ten year uh, process that was approved by City Council in the city, uh, state of Texas. Um, in uh, 2016, correct? And they have a deadline of um, uh, 2026 to have the whole project completed according to their plan. 2024. 2024. So it was initiated in 2014, um, and then they have a deadline by 2024 to have put the ribbon there for people to come and watch the ribbon cutting. Um, but this is a lot more complicated. Uh, that, has, that has been made more complicated by uh, the inaction of the leadership of those folks that are involved today uh, in, at, at the Alamo. And so we want had invited uh, folks from uh, the Alamo Defenders, uh, from the San Antonio Conservation Society, uh, the 1718 Descendants Group, uh, which all have very uh, particular concerns about the way that not only uh, they've been marginalized, from the process and push out of the decision-making processes um, with, with the Alamo, um, but that uh, also their stories are not being told, uh, are, are potentially being erased. A lot of cultural erasure is, is, is being dished up by the current leadership of uh, the, the Alamo Trust, and, and part of the reason why uh, the Tepinampo with the Nation has uh, filed uh, federal claims um, based off of the, the direction that this project has gone. Um, I think that's, uh, that's a, just a, a fair intention for what we hoped for uh, this evening. Um, and so for uh, of the, the Miss Joanne Murphy, I sent an email that she got stuck in Austin and wasn't going to be able to make it. And uh, we haven't heard from um, the San Antonio Conservation Society or the Alamo Defenders Association and so uh, what we're going to be doing this evening is um, answering some um, specific questions that, that we know are of interest that, um, that we want everyone to be clear on, um, at least from the perspective of the Tepinampo with the Nation. And we have uh, one of our, our spokespersons here, uh, Ramon Vasquez, who's going to be answering those questions. And we're going to uh, make this a conversation here brief um, as a result of the other panelists not being present um, this evening and, and hope to be able to bring those conversations uh, to the table as well because um, it's they're all valid concerns uh, that the, these different uh, associations have and so uh, we, we apologize if you were coming to uh, hear from those other associations and and hope that you'll uh, bear along with us as the three address these questions here um, very directly. Does that sound fair to everyone? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, and so uh, I'd like to begin by um, um, 
there's uh, Ramon and, and others here in the room have done extensive research um, as to the, the history of the families and the people at Mission San Antonio de Valero and, and could give a college level uh, lecture on, on all of these pieces. Um, but I, I'm going to ask you to maybe speak to um, things that maybe you uh, people don't know about the place um, or the experience there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, how African Americans and indigenous people interacted in the 19th century? Right, even further back. Or even further yeah. back, yeah. They, uh, you know, they shared the community, they shared the space, you know, it's not a little about that. We had about, um, I would say, 30 uh, families with African heritage that uh, are buried on the site, um, and countless more that were baptized. Um, they had names like Juan Blanco, uh, and you know they were intermarrying with each other. You know, other community members they were baptizing their children. They were serving as padrinos for marriages. They coexisted. Some of them were um, documented as. Esclavos libres, which means free slaves, right? So I think that's important, you know. And then there were some that were not free, right? That were clearly someone slave there. And this is in the 1700s, is what I'm talking about, the time period I'm talking about. From 1720s all the way up to about 1814, um, that, that we know that there was, you know, there was slavery on. Spanish slavery, you know, on the on the site itself. Um, you know, one of the the uh, first um, mayors of San Antonio was Victor Blanco, and he was uh, one, of the, one of the first black mayors, or he was the first black mayor of San Antonio in 1809, and and his name was Victor Blanco, and he went on to become the governor of Coahuila. Which was the province that we were under here, what we like to have. And, uh, and it's our belief that his great grandfather, Juan Blanco, was the first person buried at the cemetery in the Alamo. Um, Juan Blanco was uh, listed as, a, uh, as an African, a man of African heritage, uh, fighting with the, with the army. With, with the army of with the Spanish army, the Spanish army of Deja, he was a presidio soldier. And he was buried there. So I mean, there's a lot of rich history that is not untold. Most people wouldn't know that. Um, and what expedition was that? It wasn't an expedition. It was mm -hmm. where they came to San Antonio, 1718. So you know, there's a. I think that's pretty important history, and of course. You know all the all the American Indians that were that were on site over the years. I mean, we know the burial records had thirteen hundred people that, that were documented that were buried there. But we know through just research that there's probably more than probably about fifteen hundred that are buried in the area. And we're only talking we're only talking about this the Catholic cemetery. We're not talking about the non-Catholic cemetery. We're not talking about where people were buried. If they were not baptized. We're not talking about ancient burial grounds either. We're talking about a consecrated Catholic cemetery. Um, and so out of those 1,500, probably about over, close to about a thousand of them were American Indians that were buried there. The rest were a mixture of mestizos that came over as settlers, some Spanish, uh, African heritage, families of African heritage. Um, There's a couple of Canary Canary Islander family there that were buried there. And, um, even some French. So, you know, that's I mean there was a there was a community and I think that's the most important thing that people forget is that this was a, a, a place that people were living in. They were uh, falling in love, they were going to church, they were baptizing children, you know, children were playing in the compound. This was a, a pueblo. You know, an American Indian Pueblo, you 
know, it had it had government structure that was all native. And I think if um, I think what's happening right now is if by acknowledging that, by acknowledging the, the human by by humanizing the Alamo the San Antonio de Valero again through this process means that people have to come to grips with some of the atrocities that happened since then as well. And I think that that's what San Antonio avoided constantly. I want to underscore that matter of an unwillingness to address um, unsavory aspects of our history, right? Which we could argue that the uh, approach that is being instituted by the Alamo Trust at this point is kind of glazing over those unsavory aspects of, um, of the history of this place, of that place in particular. Um, can you talk a little bit about? Um, you know, how, how this has impacted San Antonio, this unwillingness to address those unsavory aspects of, of this place. Well, when you, can, when, when you have a $450 million project, or close to a half a billion dollar project, having its way with the history of San Antonio and the citizens that make San Antonio the great city that it is, I mean, that just, I mean, when you can, when, when the history of the civil rights through the war, you know, deseg the desegregation of the lunch counter or the marginalization of the history of the contributions of American Indians, you know, from that mission, can just be wiped away. And the city is just, um, you know, uh, just bowing down to this half a billion dollar project. I mean, says a lot. I mean, if, if, you, if you listen to people tell the story of San Antonio, you would think, well, one of my elders says that, you would think that San Antonio, when the Spanish got here, they were greeted by mariachis. Because that's all that was. He said, what's here? You know, they forget the American Indian history, forget the mulatto history, forget the history of all those people that contributed over here in the early days, the people that we celebrated last year during the tricentennial, forget their history, forget the contributions that the civil rights um, made after the Alamo. I sit on that committee, right? So I was appointed in 2014. Which committee for those that don't know? The Alamo Advisory Committee, Citizens Committee. <clears throat> and one of the things that, if you look at the plans, it talks about the interpretation plans, it talks about telling the entire story of the site. And so I often wonder to myself now, it's like, well, what are they going to say now? What are they going to say about what's happening today? What are they going to say about what's happening to the Woolworth building? What are they going to say? Um, you, the, what happened at the Woolworth building is directly related to the Alamo in terms of the myth of the John Wayne 1850s and 1960s and 1950s. All that hatred and that, that John Wayne uh, myth of the Alamo created in San Antonio. There was a lot of hate here. And, um, Can you unpack that here for a little bit? Because I know I didn't grow up with those John Wayne films, but why does that? Why would that impact me as as a younger generation? Because you know we don't we don't get a whole lot of education about uh, the the civil rights movement in the in the six in the fifties and sixties that trickled down again, of course, in part of the the. the the glazing over of difficult histories like that, you know? So can you talk about mm -hmm. the, the, the mythology impacting the way we... Um, well, it's the way it's about behaviors. It's the, way, it's the way other people behave. I don't know. I'm sure people in the, in, in the room here remember going to the Alamo. So one of these, as a, the fourth grade field trips, when you, you know, I went to, I went to, uh, I was almost uh, to an all-white school. Uh, at the time, uh, it was the central in that district. And uh, I went to another entry that was all white, primarily. And, um, and when we went to, when we went to, the, when they took us to the Alamo, you know, all my friends that uh, we played together, you know, on the playground, in the school, you know, we all hung out, we went to the Alamo. As soon as we were in the Alamo, we started hearing the history and something people were telling us about the Alamo, you know, those eyes turned on me, you know, and with hatred. And 
And I, I don't think I'm the only one. I'm sure that there's a lot of people that remember going to the Alamo and, and getting that experience because of the color of your skin, you were the bad person because of what they were saying. They were uh, Santa Ana was bad, all these other things, right? And so you were the bad person, and so you left that Alamo feeling like, as a child, I know what it made me feel like, and I'm not the only one. I've, I've heard the same story from other people. So that was the, that was what, you know, that was in the 60s, you know, early 70s. So, uh, so the crafting of the narrative, of, of the popular cultural narrative of the Alamo, framed by this John Wayne history of Texas, continues to have a ripple effect today. Well, yeah, I think so, because it's allowing people from outside of Texas to come in here and dictate our San Antonio history. You know, like Douglas McDonald, who's from Ohio or someplace. Um, you know, I, I was at a presentation a couple weeks ago, and they were giving us, a, the, the Alamo Trust was giving us a presentation on who built the Alamo and the four, the, the four different masons that built the Alamo, and these are the people that are supposed to be the professionals and the consultants. And the ones giving the presentation giving the to the Alamo Committee. Right, and, he, and they start off by saying, well, the first layer was built by some, some man named Dale. We don't know his first name. And, I'm, and then he goes on to explain who the other three were, and I'm sitting there going, how is this person who's supposed to interpret our story here in San Antonio? How does he not know that that man's name is Antonio Dale? They just wrote about him last year for the Tricentennial as being one of the greatest uh, uh, of passion and love, you know, at the Alamo because of because of what happened with him and his lover and, and the history of a murder. I mean, there's this, you know, it, so you, the people who have been around know, you know, who these people, who the players are at the Alamo historically. But what scares me the most is when you're paying high dollars for people to come in from out of town to interpret our stories and our history. That's the problem. I don't know how many people heard the... Especially when they're supposed to be experts and <clears throat> yeah. don't know basic information like the yeah. name of the masons that built well, the The first one. The yeah. first one that he laid the like, cornerstone. So, you know, I don't know how many people heard the, the interview on the source last week with uh, Councilman Trevino and Douglas McDonald. But if you heard it, if you haven't heard it, I encourage you to go back and read it. Find it online. Listen to it. Um, what was and, the date on that show? It was last Monday. So it was last Monday, so you can all go back and listen to but it. But, I mean, they talk, a caller calls in and asks about issues of slavery, and the, the, the guy in charge of the Alamo, Douglas McDonald, he answers the question with that they're only using evidence to guide this project. And then that's what's guiding all the, all the activity around the Alamo. And he says that there, was, there is no evidence of slavery at the Alamo. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, whoa, does this guy just say this? He goes, there was, slave, there, was, there was issues of slavery around Texas, and surely there was issues of slavery in other parts of the United States, but there's no evidence of it at the Alamo. <coughs> And, um, and if this is the interpretation that we're going to get, this is what our $450 million project is going to leave San Antonio for our children and our great-grandchildren to, to, uh, to be heirs of, then I think we need to do a better job as citizens to question how our tax dollars are being spent on this project and who is telling our story. I mean, um, we, you know, when we talk about the Alamo, we have a lot of issues, right, with the Alamo, but when you have, when you talk about interpretation, and we use, we're going to interpret the stories, um, you want people at the table who can assist with that interpretation. And, uh, Unfortunately, you know, a, 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 a very important piece of history from the Alamo, that community, the African-American community, was left out of this process. 
And I think that to me that's in, that's so crucial that District Two was not represented. Every every single district in San Antonio was represented on is represented on this committee, except for District Two. And uh, to me, that's a problem. Uh, I I don't think that we, as a city, as a city, we did our due diligence to make sure that the interests of our citizens were protected in this process. Um, we had myself there representing an American Indian community, uh, but it wasn't the entire American Indian community. Uh, so, but we already know what they did with us. They brought in federally recognized tribes to take us out of the picture. So, so before we, we touch that subject, I kind of want to go back um, and, and talk about, um, and, and go back to one of the things that I recall uh, uh, Mr. Douglas McDonald saying on, on that interview um, that that they wanted to restore uh, that they wanted to restore the the, the mission footprint um, and that they were going to be using evidence as the guide for uh, the, the the interpretation of the space. Would you say that there is ample evidence talking about uh, the realities of slavery and how they were? Um, uh, how that economic system was carried out in San Antonio de, de Beja, starting in that little pueblito of Mission San Antonio de Valero? I think there's uh, ample primary sources that talk about the fact that there was people that were enslaved at the Mission San Antonio de Valero. We, we have to remember that we have first-hand <coughs> We have the books, we have the baptisms, we have the marriages, and we have the burials of all uh, residents of Mission San Antonio de Valero and residents from La Villita after 1731 and even into the 1780s and early 1800s, uh, where clearly it's documented that this person that's being baptized is a child of a slave or, uh, or is getting married is a a slave of one of the, uh, uh, with the slave owner's name on there. Uh, yeah, so I would think that there's evidence that there was some, um, you know, there was issues of slavery. But there's ample evidence that there's a cemetery, you know, that there's 1,300 people, a minimum of 1,300 people buried right there on the site, and they don't care. So uh, much less what a few books written in 1700s by the Franciscans. You know what I'm going to say. So that's that's the part where I, I, I want for the audience and the people that are watching this at home to understand is the incongruency of the leadership of the Alamo Trust saying that they're going to base themselves on the concrete evidence and primary documents that exist to tell the story of to interpret the space, but there's ample evidence of these key pieces of our history that are being circumvented to only be able to tell an 1836 story of Mission San Antonio de Valero, uh, which is absolutely incomplete and and I would say an, uh, um, an offense to the future, you yeah. know, um, because that's uh, one of the, the, the pieces that, that uh, is, is like a um, lime juice going into a paper cut every time that I think about it is um, who writes their stories and who writes the, the um, uh, the, the point of departure, right? So journalists are the first draft of history, but when you actually have historians that are putting up panels at any of these um, sites of significance, what are all of the pieces that have been left out of, of the picture? And it, the selective authoring of whether it's journalists or um, researchers and scholars that are putting these pieces together it erases what isn't covered on those panels. I think what they're saying about evidence is everybody else's evidence but yours. Okay, so talk what, to us a little bit about I, what you mean by that well, as a special interest. But well, I think that you know we're going to guide let this project guide us based on evidence. I think they're talking about 1836, the Battle of 1836. They're not talking about what happened before the Battle of 1836 or after the Battle of 1836, what happened in 1836. So the fact that there's evidence about all this other history is, um, is, 
is be anymore. That that's going to be saved for the museum. So so why should that matter to the regular San Antonioan? Because when we go on the site, you know, if you, if you take a trip to the site, you know that history of if your family comes from that um, from that history from the Alto the San Antonio Bandero history, it will you will that your history will be erased from the site. You would have to go learn about it in a museum. And you probably have to pay to be able to get it. Yeah, you have to pay to get it to read about it. Whereas, you know, uh, in other cities, they'll, they embrace that history. So I think you had a question over there, though. Uh, yeah, I think this is so fantastic that uh, you're, you know, uh, so I want to thank you first uh, for uh, taking the time to talk about history. And, uh, you know, this young lady here has pointed out that. It's quite clear in America today and over the last 200 years that there's a conspiracy to erase the history that was that was here before America. Even you know uh, the uh, Marshall Trilogy in 1823, the Monroe Doctrine, the the, the uh, American Exceptionalism, Manifest Destiny, on and on. And so we see after you know 150 years of this, nothing's changed. They're going to do it again. This is what $450 million will buy you, right? Is exactly. the idea that you can change history and tell a story that, you know, is really betraying uh, the anthropology and the, the vital, the really important history has been and betrayed here. I, I want to dovetail off of that because I think that there's people that, uh, like myself, uh, were educated in Texas schools and were given the 1836 version of San Antonio in the space. Ramon, can you give us a thumbnail timeline of Mission San Antonio de Valero um, that starts from uh, founding um, uh, and uh, uh, when it became a port, when it became uh, uh, secularized, like break it down. I can't well, even. I, I don't know that I can break it completely down. I, I have a, a we have another historian that a, might be able to give yeah. us a thumbnail. There, there was a there was a several things. Seventeen eighteen. Uh, the so right the yeah. and um, and then it, where it's at right now is its third site, right, 1721, more or less, and then um, you know they were secularized in 1794, 1795. So that means they they, they were no longer oh, they no longer belong to the church. Officially secularized by the church in 1795, 1794. Which made it civilian. But not San Antonio. Not San Antonio. They continue to use the church as a mission, as a church, I'm sorry, they continue to use the mission as a church, right? And it wasn't until 1825 that the Bishop of Guadalajara, is that right, Monterrey? That the Bishop of Monterrey actually had to send a letter over here to the, to the priests here telling them, stop using the Alamo. Stop burying people there, stop holding services there. Um, you know, this was, this was, it was still being used, right? So there was still built, being, people being buried there, uh, people being baptized there. And, uh, so, but there's, there's just, a, there's, a, there's a lot of history. I mean, there's, a, there's all kinds of events that happen that need to be documented. One of the things that we've been asking for is a complete historical investigation of, of, um, of the site, which has never been done, right? Basically, that means that... Uh, Basically, what that means is that you do all the research, right? You document all the all the history, all the stories, um, you know, all the, the, the families that did the cattle drive, the families that came out and fought off the Apaches, you know, the you know all the different things that happened. At Milo Park, they did a, a, a they just finished up the the investigation report for Milo Park at 600 pages. At the Alamo, we can't get one page written. We have to depend on outside consultants to come in and wait till they unveil the mission to see how they're going to, I mean, the, uh, the, the museum, so that we can see how they're going to interpret our story. So, uh, In the presentations that have been made to the um, Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee, um, has there been uh, any conversation about a full archival study being a part of uh, the, the process? No. Why or why not? Well, well they just hasn't been. We, uh, people have asked if 
So one thing that they did do, they brought in um, a professor from university from the <coughs> Trinity University, I believe, to um, to do a a report on the Woolworth Building and to determine whether the importance of the Woolworth Building in regards to the African American history during the Civil Rights. And we were given a preliminary or brief um, on the on the report. And I have to tell you, if if based on what I heard, if that's the type of investigative research they want to do, I'd rather not have them do it for us. But somebody, uh, other, other members of the committee asked. You know, it was unfortunate because the brief of that that story, what, what we took, what I took away from that presentation from that professor, was that yes, the Woolworth Building is important, but it's it's there are other places in San Antonio that are just as important, if not more important, for the black community in San Antonio. To me, that was key for. There's no reason to keep the Woolworth Building. We can interpret the civil, the black civil rights history in San Antonio and any other building. We don't have to do it this at this one. It wasn't the first lunch counter. Crest desegregated their lunch counter 30 minutes before the Woolworth Building did. Wow. That's how. So you know. So that's a, that's key. That's code talk. You know, we have to pay attention. There's a lot of code talk going on, and um, so that's why we're 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 doing our own investigation, you know, our own research and studies, and you know, we that's why we we commissioned that um, we commissioned that um, Alamo report. It's about seventy pages, uh, just on the. We as the Capilano, not as Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee, mm -hmm. right? So, can you talk to us a little bit about what the mode of um, what the what the process for interpreting, um, or if you're aware if it's been discussed at the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee, how uh, the Alamo Trust is going to be making its decisions on how things are interpreted, um, or is it just behind closed doors and we have to deal with whatever it is that they decide? I don't know. I don't know. I've asked a question. I've uh, posted a question. <coughs> A couple weeks ago, to um, our tri chairs, uh, asking that specific question: What is the purpose of our committee? What is um, how do we make decisions? Uh, because right now we are not making decisions. Right now we're being told, you know, um, what's happening, but we're not. In, we're not making decisions as to you know. Yeah, Gene Powell. Hmm? No, Gene Powell. The meetings, I think. One of the public meetings we had, we referenced it. We were in the Yeah, but we haven't, Gene Powell hasn't been around in about two years. So you're saying that he, that he didn't keep his word? Uh, I, I don't know, but he kept his word. He was the chair, right? For the trust? No. No. I'm talking about the tri chair. The, I'm talking about the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee. Well, yeah, so so let's, let's go back a little bit that's to. That's part of the history of cool. Yeah. I don't know whether he kept his word or not. This is the city. This is the city committee. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, who some of the, the players are, because not everybody here um, in this space has been on top of, of the issue um, as, as as something that's a daily matter. So um, the the citizens advisory committee was created by uh, the city council to be uh, initially the the. Uh, setting the, the pillars and the benchmarks for the things that needed to be included, the processes that needed to be uh, taken into consideration for this Alamo development project. Uh, then, um, I, 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 I want to say that it was in, before 2014, but you can correct me, in that uh, the Daughters of the Republic of Texas uh, hand, uh, were, uh, were uh, required to hand over administrative um, leadership of the operations at the Alamo to uh, an entity that was created by the state of, uh, excuse me, an entity that was created by the General Land Office called the Alamo Trust. So you have the Alamo Trust Incorporated, which manages the day-to-day -day operations of the Alamo, 
Above them is the general land office, and then above them, of course, is the governor's office. And uh, on the ground here in San Antonio, you have um, and the, the Alamo Trust Incorporated, um, and then a few other nonprofits that were created to bring um, monies into the redevelopment project, uh, which also include the Alamo Endowment and uh, the Save the Alamo Foundation. So those are uh, three nonprofit entities that are pulling in funds uh, to manage the project, um, the, the, the redevelopment project. Um, other players that are important for folks to understand is, as we move into current litigate conversations around current litigation, um, is the Texas Historical Commission. And the role of the Texas Historical Commission is to acknowledge and protect a variety of different historical, um, uh, uh, they have lots of different things that are under their umbrella of obligations. Uh, but one of them is to provide the certifications um, and designations and protections for historical cemeteries. Um, and whenever it is that the, the city or the county is going to be carrying out any uh, research or scholars that are going to be doing research at archaeological sites, at known archaeological sites, they have to get their permits from the Texas Historical Commission before they go into these particularly sensitive uh, uh, spaces. And so when we, when we come back into uh, the Alamo, I want everyone to bring up the Alamo in their mind, right? You're, you're looking at the shrine in front of you. The cenotaph is on your left-hand side. The gazebo is over here on your right-hand side. Are we all there together? Right? So there is evident uh, uh, reports from the Texas Historical Commission issued to Bear County for uh, uh, utilities work that was going to be carried out acknowledging the cemetery. And uh, that is on that site that they that the Bear County had to get permits from the Texas Historical Commission um, that that already had a um, a, a uh, archaeological site designation number de uh, assigned to the cemetery there in the Alamo. Um, I flipped open one of these reports because there's a stack about yay high of these reports um, that shows where Alamo Street um, is is not on the proper grid. It's kind of like it's a little chueco, it's a little angled over. And in the documentate the, the explanation of that map, it showed that the reasoning for the, uh, the the city of San Antonio to make that street be at an angle is because it had to avoid the Campo Santo, the cemetery that's there uh, currently under the US Post Office, uh, potentially under the Santa Fe, and uh, in all of these spaces on, on the left-hand side if we're looking at, at the church. Additionally, uh, based off of evidence and not, not only practice, burial practices and how it is that, that these colonial churches or shrines were built, we know that there are people buried underneath uh, in the church and then in literally in the walls because that was custom that people were buried in the walls. Uh, we know um, uh, because our, our relatives uh, reinterred um, a cranium in uh, 1994, is that correct? Or 95? Um, at that site, um, that, that there, ha there are other bodies that are buried there. We, we have an obligation um, as a tribal community to continue to um, obviously, like, you know, bring these things to the surface, have these conversations. You know, we, we have a, a moral obligation. To, uh, to, to bring these, these issues uh, to conversation uh, more broadly, which is why we're having these forums and inviting you all to be a part of the conversation and, and help us to push the conversation out more broadly, um, not only through social media, but at your dinner tables and talking to your relatives about what's, what's really going on here, because this not only uh, impacts the Tepinamco and Tepi Nation, but it impacts the entire city of San Antonio, and I would argue even the state of Texas, because the, the, the willingness to selectively omit history at the Alamo, as is being done by the Alamo Trust, uh, based off of some of the examples that we had here in the previous conversation, 
that is unjust to the city of San Antonio and to those people who are um, required to know our history, required to tell these stories. So we have, um, so so we have all of these different pieces. Sorry, I got late. We're confused to to lines of thinking. So uh, number one, uh, can we trust the uh, Alamo Trust to interpret the space in a proper, whole, authentic manner? I don't. Based off of the conversations that we've had here, it doesn't sound like they're interested in telling any story outside of the 1836 um, mythology, right? it's, which is very incomplete. Um, but then how do we get these conversations um, to matter to the folks in the city of San Antonio? Uh, because this is, this is going to be happening on our watch. You know that you're going to sink another $450 million to renovate it again. At least not in my time or my kids' lifetime, you know. So we have a responsibility to have that here and now, um, have those stories told um, here and now. Um, the first thing we have to get rid of is all of us call it, calling us Latinos and Hispanics, which we ain't. Yeah, I think it's uh, you know, I, I think the history we mentioned earlier. It's it's not even about. It's a, if we talk about site-specific stuff, right, and because that's really what they're honing in on, you know, to avoid the, to, to threaten the Woolworth building, you know, to, to threaten the um, civil rights uh, activism by the African American community, to disregard slavery, the issue of slavery uh, at this, on the site, to disregard the, the final resting place of, of, of American Indians, and other Spanish settlers uh, on the site and mestizos um, on the site. I think that the continuation of, of, of um, cultural genocide, that's what that is. You know, when you erase that history from a site, that's cultural genocide. Regardless of what culture, you know, if you're impacted by what culture, that's cultural genocide. To say that we're going to tell your story, yeah, you were born there, but you know what? I'm not going to tell. I'm not going to tell nobody you were born there. You'll have to go to a museum to hear about what life was like over there. Pay to get into a museum. Maybe if the hours work for you, yeah. you know, and to I be think, able to get in there. And I think that's. I think that, that we can't lose sight of that. We can't lose sight because we're going to inherit all this. The city of San Antonio is going to inherit this, and right now, um, if they if they continue on the path that they're on, we will only know that site as the Battle of the 1836, and that's it. We won't know nothing else. I don't want to interrupt. You may be able to help you. This record that this gentleman is filming is it for? Uh, uh, no, neither one of these are for us. Uh, uh, the Papilan, these are folks that are uh, documenting for individual purposes. But this, this will all be available. Yeah, he does public access to the yes. Well, my name is Richard Garay, and it, to follow up and support and compliment Ramon's statement about slaves, tell the Alamo Trust people to do themselves a favor. I've already done the research, but let them do their own research. You want to count how many slaves there were in the Spanish colonial and post-colonial period in San Antonio. The Bear County Archives, the Spanish records, the Spanish <coughs> section of the county clerk has no less than 250 and as many as 300 wills and estates starting as early as I think 17, I want to say 43. But every one of the people that are, did, did a will itemize their property. And part of their property were their slaves. And their slaves are identified by name. And if they were black, they were called mulatos. They were called several other ethnic extractions. So if you want to go count slaves, you can do it very easily by sending somebody to bear the Spanish archives. And they're very detailed. Whether the slave was healthy or whether he limped, right. 
They're very detailed. Well, I think the so the question about slavery is clear cut and it's already been yeah. identified. I think the the important piece is why why are you omitting that? Why are you uh, minimizing that on the site? Well, right, not you, but the Alamo, the people that are in charge, right? So, so since we're creating a record, they can consult this record and tell them that on I'm this sure day, Doug is the, the putting an assistant on it. Documented I, it. I would add another aspect is uh, the, to to for us to consider in terms of the the intentionality of the omission when we talk about 1836 and the secession of Texas from Mexico. Yes. In that we don't have enough conversation or hardly any conversation of how Mexico abolishing slavery had to do, how much the abolition of slavery in Mexico had to do with Texians initiating their rebellion against Mexico because it was an economic order that they were unwilling to shift away from. And, and that part in our, in our Texas history is not discussed. It's always talked about liberty and all of these different pieces. But once but again, in the Spanish archives, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Bear County Spanish archives, there is a decree from the Cortes de Cadiz. Cadiz is a city in the southernmost part of Spain. In the, state of the, the courts of Spain in Cadiz in 1318. 114, issued a decree for all the kingdom of New Spain, of which Texas was a part. They said, all slaves are hereby emancipated. So you, you cannot any longer be considered a slave. Everybody ignored it, but officially, it, the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 of Abraham Lincoln came very late in the Americas compared to how the Spanish treated person known as a slave. So they were all, had, had all been emancipated long before Lincoln did his thing. Well, that's where the... Like, well, then, and service. of course, in Texas, right. you know, and, and there were some of the Mexico, Mexico followed up with um, their own decree emancipating slaves in Mexico, of which Texas was a part until I mean, these trees, this Mexico, the Mexico City does have the records where they had filed for them to bring their attention to service. I used to do a little okay. slaves, but I think it became a block at the same time of that and second now, line with the Alamo. But I cut off that route because it shows buoy there in New Orleans during the transatlantic trade. Family's law transporting the Moors down to uh, uh, Galveston Bay was a block down to the Rio Grande where they would attack them and free them and make sure the black lanterns. Yeah. Let, let me say, let me say, but the Moors got his name. The Moors killed the Moors. They just were killing the slave traders. The, 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 the important date that just passed us is November the 16th. November the 16th is the day that the priest officially declared the present Campo Santo in the present church that is today the chapel at the Alamo. He declared it in Campo Santo. He blessed all the stations of the cross and his name was Fry, he was a Franciscan, Father Martin Garcia. And he entered, he made an entry in the baptismal record book. Because when you baptize a church, you Christian the church, you give it its religious name. In canon law, that's the way you're supposed to do it. And we have that document. Right. It's just been redone. The, the book has just been fixed. It just got completely redone. The Catholic Archives has it. But they won't let you look at it. Yeah. Those are the. Can you go are, take pictures of it and well, then text them over yeah. to Douglas McDonald? Yeah. <laughs> well, I have the picture. I have the picture of that entry. I think it's really important, though. You know, I think, you know, for so uh, for the 16th, yeah. drill it into his head. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think I think what's really important is that um, that we have processes in place, right? That we can participate in in one way or another. And we participated in this process through the Alamo Advisory Citizens Advisory Committee. We've participated now, we're participating through federal court. Yeah. Right? right. Because because the process that was in play didn't, didn't work. It yeah. wasn't working. And it's still, I mean, when you have the leadership of the Alamo saying that there was no evidence of slavery 
at the Alamo? That's the problem for me, right? Well, I mean, they had it's the Alamo. Right. Right. There's, there's, abundant, there's, abundant, there's abundant evidence. And another thing, since we're being recorded, the first person buried in the present church of the Alamo, in that cemetery, his name was Tomas, and he was a Yerpitiami Indian. He's buried in the south transept yeah. of the church. And in the center part, on the same day when the priest blessed the Campo Santo, he buried a Canary Islander whose name was Bueno y Rojas. He, he, those are just the two inside the church. And the cemetery, of course, extends all the way out into the plaza. And there's, you have to say plural, cemeteries. Yeah. Because as, as each church was built and as it fell down, it was a cemetery. And it, they just moved over to the new church and built that church and its cemetery. So I think we have about $450 million worth of questions. I think he's going to put some here. Okay, so um, we're going to take one more question and then I want to switch gears a little bit into um, uh, the organizing questions that we have because. Uh, like I said, we could spend, it's a whole college course on, on the, the untold stories and the history of Mission San Antonio de Valero on, on its own. Uh -huh. this picture right here. So, um, give me just a second. Um, isn't there anyone that can write a book about what is going on in the effort to visit any history or something? They, they, you know, that talks about Because a lot of people are not aware of that and through reading in the book, you know, it, it halts this uh, disgusting criminality. Well, my, 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 my yes, and um, there are multiple people that are, that are documented. And the thing is, all of those binders of evidence, all of that content is there. Where we are hearing and understanding is that there is an unwillingness of the leadership of the Alamo Trust and the General Land Office, and by default, the city of San Antonio and the state of Texas, an unwillingness to actually incorporate all of the spectrum of evidence in the interpretation of the stories, and that willingness by the Alamo Trust makes the city of San Antonio complicit in the omission of the history of its own people. So we have a, a question in the back, and then I'm going to put in the clutch and talk a little bit more about the uh, statement towards uh, the slavery that supposedly was non-existent. Uh, Spain had an encomienda system, and even though it was uh, transferred to be that they were no longer accepting maybe slavery, they were making vessels of the king. But this is something that is written about by the second society that they were the ones imported to do the work because the, uh, the Caracuas and the Tacuas refused to mix with the Spaniards or, or be. Christians. This is a statement that is written. That uh, can be overwhelmed by Spanish civilization that by when they became a broken people. When they're always destroyed, they became completely apathetic to life in the Spanish mission system. Their choices were these work to death, become a fugitive, or die at the hands of the hostile Apache. Death was the only escape these Indians had. Is that not slavery? So, right. Well, that's another, yeah, yeah. And the colonial experience there at missions, at, the, at, our, at our missions is very important. That is all the lies that they want to hide from all the tourists. I'm so, sorry, what was that? When we're bringing up, uh, I had a battle of 15 years just to get indigenous people to recognize in San Antonio. And that is a part of how they oppress, repress our identity and our existence and our struggle as indigenous people. So what Ramon is doing is very vital, what Tapilam is doing is vital. It's, 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 you're, you're, you're speaking truth to power. And, and power squashes any truth. It puts it in darkness. As, as I'm reading right now, it, it's a part of all this syst systematic injustice. You know, it's, it's, it's endemic. And they, they don't want the tourists to come over here and hear all this, how San Antonio was actually created. That we were here as free people and then converted into vessels of the crown, basically slaves, without being called slaves. How black people were sold at a slave trading block there in front of the Alamo. This is all a part of our history. It should be told. I agree. 
So then, in this exercise of speaking truth to power, uh, you'd already mentioned the lawsuit. Um, has there been any conversation or dialogue um, or, or seeking to, um, to find a redress on behalf of the Alamo Trust um, with, with the Tapilam or anybody else? No, no, I, no. I, they're, they're on a trajectory to get the job done to please Mr. Phil Collins and his $15 million collection. You know, and all these other people that they're referring to as investors. But, you know. Can you, can you you're saying referring to investors, but I, I think, it, can you be more clear as to what we're talking about in terms of the breakdown of who's actually pitched in to date so to make this project happen? The, the city and the state for $130 million. So, so far they've exhausted the taxpayers' funds. And they're relying on the investors, private investors, to complete the other three hundred million, right? And so I think that's the, the the biggest issue, right? That they have to meet this deadline because that's the promise. But in in the documents in the in the court litigation, we haven't gone, we haven't had a hearing. Uh, we're waiting on the judge to schedule a hearing, a date. We had one, but two days before the hearing, uh, the, the their, their lawyers dropped about 700 pages worth of documents on the judge. Were the GLO or? All of them. All four. Were they there to the GLO? Mm -hmm. The city, the state, the city, the GLO, the Alamo Trust. And the who's the league? Who's the general? The GLO? That all four of them are independent. So uh, they filed this, you know, so the judge needed more time to review their uh, their documents and then, you know, and then all of these came. So, but in those documents, it's really interesting because the opening, uh, the opening uh, <coughs> paragraphs allude to that if the judge rules on in favor of our claim, then it'll basically just shut down the project. So it's like uh, fear mongering, and uh, we're in 2020, and we're using fear mongering to get our way in San Antonio, which is obviously the way things are done here, I guess, because. Our history has been marginalized for uh, for for uh, decades and maybe even centuries, and uh, here we are entering into a new decade, and we're starting it off really bad. I don't know what's you know in terms of my the future for this site, you know, in regards to my children. I don't know what kind of an Alamo history they're going to inherit. So my grandchildren. Not my even that when we talk about cracking with the battle of Fort Bibbs and some natives. I mean, these people aren't just treasonous Mexicans. Yes. Yeah. So one of the things that I do, I was talking about processes. And in the process, in the early 20, 2014, we engage, in, when I say we, I'm talking about the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee. We engage in developing the guiding principles that would set the stage for how this project would move, would be unfolded over the years. And one of those, uh, one of those guiding principles, uh, one of the, the themes that, that came out for that guiding principle was about healing, and that this had to be a site of healing. We had to focus in this album. We had an opportunity, you know, for the city, for the state, and we could use it. And there had to be healing involved in the site. There is no healing going on right now. We have five battlefronts with the Alamo. The Alamo defenders have filed a lawsuit. The NAACP is, uh, and has been fighting with the issue of the Woolworth and the desegregation of the uh, Woolworth building, the, count, the lunch counter. The San Antonio Conservation is fighting to preserve the building from being demolished because they're going to they're going to move forward with demolishing that building. Um, to turn it into the private museum. That's yes. You know, we're fighting the issue of the, of the cemetery. Um, you know, and so this is now. Who knows what's going to happen within the next few months? Uh, you know, who knows? You know, there might be other lawsuits. But, you know, there is no healing going on. And I've already I've asked and I've reached out to several San, leaders in San Antonio asking them, is there no one that will stand up and, talk, and, and try to bring some sense to, to this um, to this to this site, you know, I mean, when you have that, when you have that many, 
when you have that many battlefronts, right, there can't be nothing, it can't be all good with the outcome of the site. And um, so, so Ramon, right there, I think that that's that's a really important piece. That there's all of these different battlefronts that the Alamo uh, renovation project is 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 seeing. Can that be an opportunity for the general public to be able to apply pressure? And where are strategic places that the public can apply pressure in these circumstances well, that we're in still, right now? I, I still say it's easy that maybe the Reader's Digest, they can help put, publish an article saying the true story of, of the history of the Alamo. Well, I, I welcome any journalists, writers, media makers, Storytellers, puppeteers, you name it. You want to come and tell, expand the narrative, like however water. that is, like you know. Water. Water. Well, you know, there's a lot of people that know the true story, but no. they don't want to come out and say it because they're too scared. Oh, okay. See, I have this picture right here, and um, back then when they took this picture, they took some of my my. It's a grandma of mine took some of her kids away. They were left only with a boy and a girl. And it's a very old, old picture. It sends chills up and down my body. It's very old. Terrible. And uh, I am a descendant from the Mission San Jose. This picture was taken there. She lived there. And that, and one of them little rooms in there. So remember, can you kind of um, discuss with us and whoever is listening at home about um, specific pressure points that the general public can address? You know, I, yeah, I still think that the city council has to, uh, you know, weigh in a little bit more. Uh, I was told that the city council members could not speak to me anymore because of oh. the lawsuit. So I, I don't believe that that's the case because the city is in litigation constantly with the fire department, police department. They're constantly that they're constantly having conversations. Uh, I was disinvited from a fundraiser, you know, because of other people that were at the fundraiser. So, you know, I, I think that the, I think certain people know that that the city dug themselves into a, a, a hole and, and they did they, they can't find a way out, but I, I do still think that, um, you know, I think the city council should be called, I think people should be saying, look, you know what, uh, tell us what's going on with the Alamo, be more transparent, uh, let us know how our $150 million is being used. Uh, I think somebody should call the county and thank them, thank the county for doing what they did in 2005 <coughs> in regards to the cemetery, because they're the, only, they're the only political entity of the state that did that recognized the Alamo Cemetery back in 2005. And uh, because of what they did, the Texas Historical Commission had to recognize it as well. And that's why we're in this battle right now over the cemetery, uh, because there's some inconsistencies and there's some um, things that should have been that should have been applied that were not applied because it's the Alamo. So, uh, in terms of uh, antiquity laws and things like that. So, and other cemetery protections that have not been paid. I mean, that look, wouldn't happen in I mean, any other cemetery. Look, look at Sugarland in, in Houston. A year and a half ago, Sugarland, they found the, I mean, have you, have you, have you, have you ever heard of Sugarland 95? The Sugarland 95? Okay, the Sugarland 95 was two years, two and a half years ago in Fort Bend County. Uh, the, the school district wanted to build a new building. So they started digging. They were told, look, this could be a cemetery. We don't know. Uh, but they started digging anyway. They, they started digging. They came across a body. They went to the Texas Historical Commission said, look, we found a body. We're just going to move it, get out of the way. We're going to continue building our building. Texas Commission said, no, you're going to go in there and you got to find, you got to keep digging until you find no more bodies. Because, because we told you that it was a cemetery. Okay? You gotta keep digging. So they According made Fort Bend. The yeah, they made Fort Bend and Bend School District dig the entire site until all there was no more bodies. By the time they were done, they had dug 95 bodies out of this site. 
this site was the site of the Black Convict Cemetery. Okay? So it was historical. There was family members that were still alive that were connected to the, to the people that were buried there. And so they were made to... So, so they went to court. The, in the, school, the, the independent school district went to court to get a court order to remove all those bodies so they could build their building. Last year, actually at the beginning of this year, they dropped their lawsuit and said, forget it, we're just going to leave it at the cemetery. There was just too much uh, public uh, outcry about the cemetery. And Fort Bend County even kicked in a million dollars to help find, to help do DNA to find the family members of that cemetery. And what we're saying here is, why can't we do that at the Alamo? When we have families here that are directly related, lineal descendants of the people that are buried in that cemetery. Right? So, you know, you can't apply the laws to one culture or one group or one place and not equally apply it someplace else. And that's exactly what, that's why we're in court. That's why we're in court. But they're only digging to a certain depth so they don't. Well, that's, yeah, they're purposely doing, so you know, in the past month they found over 200 bones, right? Uh, they're in, so, and, and the month before that they found other bones, right? They've been finding bones, they're going to find bones, they're digging the cemetery. But they're only going deep enough so that they're going, they know they're going to find bones because the bones have been scattered throughout his, because of history, right? Because of all the utility work and all the other excavations. But they're purposely not going deep enough to hit what they call articulated remains, full bodies, caskets, things like that. They're purposely not doing that. Um, Why is that? And that's because that's a practice that uh, archaeologists engage in when there's a very special project that needs to happen. Because they know that if they found a body, they found an articulated body, that by law they would have to stop. And the, the law of Texas says you cannot build improvements on a cemetery, on top of a cemetery. Huh. So they're going to go deep, just, as, just far enough that they need to, because all the previous system archaeological reports already told them that they're three meters deep. That's where the bodies are. So as long as they stay within that three meters, they're not going to hit the body. They're going to hit are disarticulated remains, which are means fragments. And basically they're saying that that's why it's not a cemetery, because they're just fragments. Basically saying that our people, uh, the people of San Antonio, that our culture back then when our people died, we would break their bodies up into little pieces and throw their bones around. And that's how they got there. And that's so that's part they, of the justification that's for saying why it's not a cemetery. Right. We've also heard them say that because there's no headstones, it's not a cemetery. And, and besides on the air, on Texas Public Radio, saying that we're going to guide this interpretation of the space based off of the evidence that's on record, there's ample evidence that there's a cemetery there on the site, but again, selectively being omitted in the interpretation yeah, of the, the site. The evidence that they're choosing to guide this project is quite, very selective. And so, and so as the citizens of, of San Antonio, we have an obligation to call our city and county representatives Thank to you. make and, and state representatives, councilmen, councilwomen, anyone that has authority over these this this project, or not even the project, but over you know uh, these leaders that we put in positions to represent us. We were right? told that the city has told us or has made it clear that they. They, are, they wish they could do something, but their hands are tied because the GLO is running the show. And we have said in public and to other city leaders is that you know, that's, that's not entirely true. You're still responsible landowners, right? You own the land. So, you know, if they found a brick of gold during their dig, the Alamo Trust is not going to claim it. The city of San Antonio is going to say, that's our gold. It's on our land. So it's ours. So what's the difference between that pile of gold, the hypothetical pile of gold, or a very likely, you know, coffin? So who's claiming the hundreds of bones that have already been dug up? The Catholic Church claimed it in 
Are you talking about the hundred? No, I'm talking about the human remains that no. came out over the last one and a half. No, they're in the vault. They're right now they're in the Allen vault underneath the uh, the current store that they have on the site. Okay. Uh, wanna be able to kind of shift another um, storyline into the scenario for those that are still being educated as to why it is that the Papinan public that the nation is so deeply invested in making sure that this is done the right way outside of the obvious reasons that we've already discussed as being folks that are direct lineal descendants of those that are buried there at, at the Alamo. And, um, at, at, at Krista Santa Rosa Hospital, uh, when they were doing their prayer garden um, and uh, in a project that, again, was a multi-million dollar project that we know that that's the Campo Santo, that's one of the first cemeteries of, of the city of San Antonio, right? And they found all of these human remains when they were digging up their, you know, preparing their prayer garden. Um, the Tapilan Coitecan Nation, as long with the uh, Canary Islander Associations and other associations of or the earliest families of San Antonio, were brought in to come up with a plan of what to do with this, the, the human remains that were found there and to give them a proper reburial because that was what was ultimately decided by the, the descendant groups. Well, we, we threatened to sue them, we to take them to court if they didn't change course. And they, the sisters of the, sisters of the incarnate word, made the decision that, to do the right thing and they dropped the court case. They dropped the, their, their petition to have all the bodies removed. And they chose to work with the descendants, you know, to move the body along. Right, and so the prayer garden is still being constructed. Uh, architects were brought on board to be able to create a redesign so that those the, the that Campo Santo, that cemetery underneath, would no longer be disturbed. Right, and so you have known descendant organizations, uh, such as the ones that have been mentioned, that have been involved. Most recently, even here at Maverick Plaza, at La Villita, that was the second site of Mission San Antonio de Valero, uh, where they had a cemetery as well, and have been brought on board as part of the consulting uh, communities um, as interested parties um, with any bones that they find to be able to be uh, involved in the determination of what happens, because the city of San Antonio and everybody that knows anything about like the earliest families in San Antonio acknowledges the Tapilam as uh, some of those original descendants of those original families with direct bloodlines to all five of the missions and beyond, right? But they so, don't remove the bodies, they just leave them there. They just remove the, the But you, you, you typically, like, according to standard practice, you ask the family what's going to be done with them, and then a decision is made. At this project that we're dealing with at the Alamo, all of these standard conventions that would otherwise be carried out have been chunked out the window and on our watch. And as significant as this place is, as, as that, that footprint is in the minds of every Texan, that um, a false and incomplete narrative is being bulldozed through literally, and we're being told by our city leadership, oh, our hands are tied, sorry. And, and that's absolutely unacceptable. So Ramon, I, I wanted to, um, so you know, I asked you about how it is that, that people can uh, apply pressure, you know, city, county, federal, um, and I would also argue uh, or uh, not argue, but like suggest for those of you that know writers, that know journalists, that know media makers, that know artists, um, people that are, are able to carry a message and carry this palabra across to get them activated. This isn't something that's going to necessarily be won by a lawsuit. Yeah, the lawsuit's going to be the one that makes the decisions on, on that level, but it requires public pressure to be able to get articles in the newspaper, uh, stories on TV, um, public access, public radio, every avenue to be able to talk about this in a coherent and intelligent way because we may not have the millions and millions of dollars for a PR and communications campaign um, that the Alamo Trust has uh, to, to work with, 
but we have the population of the city of San Antonio that deserves to know its own history and should be enraged at the way that this is being carried out. And so that's where our responsibility is. And you took time out of your Tuesday night to be here with us this evening, and we thank you uh, for, for, for uh, giving your most precious resource, which is your time. Um, and, and we put that, respond, that, that, that seed of, of personal responsibility back into you if you're not already involved in, um, in, in some sort of advocacy around this issue. Uh, talk to us. We'll find a way to get you plugged in. We have plenty of ways of being able to, to activate folks that want to be involved. And, and if you have a community organization or a church group or, you know, your tamalada that's coming up, that, that you want to invite uh, someone from Tepian to come and speak and, and share these pieces to educate people, uh, talk to us um, here afterwards and we'll be happy to, to make arrangements because um, this is a really unique and opportune time for us to be able to have some backbone in Bayardia and, and to be able to push back and, and demand that our stories are told at this place because it's so much easier for them to give it a coat of stucco and move on. What are the reasons that they were able Could to... Let me just address something. We just found out, I have some of the pictures, I'm going to go into an inventory of secret objects that Red Macombs has in his office with the Kiowa Nation, the Lakota Nation. I was horrified. He's going to return with one of those brother nations to come and reclaim even Indian dresses. They put in a squad, Indian dresses. It is so shameful. I was crying out. I'm going to do an inventory and we will reclaim all those subjects. Red Macombs, and I finish, the city and the Alamo Trust, or Alamo Endowment, or Alamo Foundation, the three nonprofits. It is sad for us Indians. It is very, very sad that, you know, we have this kind of a people. And remember, George P. Bush, I was there present testifying for the charges that were put against him. He lost the public trust because of mismanagement. And when one of the senators, or, and I finish, of the Texas Finance Committee, Wilson, asked him why so many nonprofits, which he was legally, why not put the manager that will, that will manage the animal and the payroll of the Texas General Land Office? Simple than that. That is correct. Simple than that. He answered because the liability. He had to protect these filthy, very wealthy millionaires that he put in these three nonprofits as a board. And now we know that one of them has secret objects of many of our Indian tribe brothers or relatives. And it's shocking when you will see the collection display. It's sad. It is a very sad day, you know, today. And we're happy that you are bringing all these issues and challenges because we're going to shut that project. We're going to shut the pro I don't care if it's 4,500 cents or 150 cents. It's not enough what they're doing, seeing, and I finish taking every bone over people who are with them. And I am Pacoche. My mother is Pacoche. How they dare to take every more bone for the last, what, two months? Yeah. This needs to be <clears throat> stopped. We're going to enter it and back it. It's yeah. all that I can tell you. Okay. Yeah. The project is cursed. But I think, it's um, an Indian curse. I, I think that it's the, the, you know, we just have to understand that the history of the marginalized community that have been historically marginalized continues to this day with this very important project that's half a billion dollars that's going to stay in San Antonio. And I think that we have to we have to remember we have to remember that that it's happening right now. And um, and they're counting on people who have been apathetic. 
they're counting on right. people not caring enough about the issue because um, that's just the way our communities are, right? That's how we can get, that's how people get things, um, uh, that's how things get, um, how we get written out of things. Uh, because I want to, so one of the things that I was told one day, uh, I was on the, um, I was on the uh, Community and Police Relations Committee, and I was appointed by the mayor. And the mayor, told, the mayor said, we, this was during the time of what was going on in Charlottesville and in Baltimore. And uh, the mayor said, well, we're not San Antonio, and we're, I mean, we're not Baltimore, and we're not Charlottesville. We don't have those problems. And I, and I, I responded by saying, but you know what? San Antonio's worse. Because we don't talk about those problems. We suppress them, and our communities are used to doing that. That's just the way we are treated. We, uh, we were used to being treated this way. Many of our families have been shamed out of our cultures for centuries. And here we have an opportunity of taking a $450 million and helping it put, be put right back on, a, on the right track. And Tell the true stories and the history, the rich history of this site so that all of Texans can enjoy it, so all the future generations can enjoy it, and our children that are going to inherit this project can be proud of the decisions that we made as a community, or they're going to be ashamed of what we did or didn't do. That's our reality. We will be judged, we will be judged by the morale of our time. Is there any way of getting Mexico involved to say they have perfect records of all their military? Where are the, the fallen soldiers? Where did they put them? Where did they bury them? What did they do with them? And get them in. Well, that's where the investigation, the investigative uh, research would come in. That's why it's so important to do it. We got to, you have to have paid professionals to come in and do that, investigate the, that in depth research on the site because we're gonna miss it. We're gonna it, they're gonna miss it. I mean that's why it gets that's why Douglas McDonald gets paid two thousand dollars a day. She well. And only has to work fourteen days a month. Because from he's one gonna, so he, be below six yeah, feet. Yeah so he they're gonna so they they're, have to dig below six yes, feet right yes, they do. So the, 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 the consultants on this project just, the amount of money that's been spent on this project, the amount of money that's being taken out of San Antonio, right, because of this project, is going to, um, you know, all these consultants are going to go home, and they're going to leave us here with this, and they're and we'll never see them again. Right. And but we will see. But we will see every single person that helped make these decisions along the way. The greatest. And we have to remember that. You have to remember it in elections. You have to remember it in council meetings, whenever you can. You know, remind them of you know. Inaction is the same. What did Martin Luther King say? It's not the it's not the uh, it's not the words of my enemies that we will remember, but the silence of our friends. And to me, that is that is what's driving this right now. Is are you going to be silent? Or are you going to speak up? If you're not going to speak up, if you're not going to get into this, into this little battle, then step aside and don't be a hindrance. Get out of the way, because some people have chosen to battle and to fight and to try to protect the only history that we have left of the first families of this city, whether they were mulatos, American Indians, mestizos. Lobos, coyotes, whatever Spanish pasta you want to give them. You know, that's why we're fighting. And so, uh, I think that's the other time. Yeah, yeah. so um, before, um, I can just want a couple more minutes if you'll bear along with us. So what you've received here is a sample letter that you can use to communicate uh, with our uh, local leadership. 
Um, if you want it to have it translated, to send it to the Mexican consulate, adelante. We're, we're trying to encourage leadership, you know, from everyone uh, to be able to take this on um, in a personal way, in a way that matters to you, because it should matter to all San Antonians and all Texans, right? So there's that sample letter, and if you need it digitally, holler at me, and I'll get it back to you later. On our website, uh, that's listed on here at the bottom, and uh, it's highlighted as tepilam.org. On that website, there are Apple videos, um, uh, graphics, uh, history. Oh, you can have, you can nerd out and have a great time reading the website. There's tons of content contextualizing um, the Tepinam and this Alamo struggle. So you're all welcome to go on there and read. There's a, uh, a link uh, to a poster like this that we are asking for our, our supporters to download, print, and put either, you know, on your homes, on your cars, your favorite coffee shop, uh, places of business, um, any other uh, publications that you're involved in, uh, to be able to, um, we, we have to create waves around this, and so this is one of those beautiful visuals that, that represents our future. Um, this, this young man here is an uh, eagle dancer, and so we want to, you know, uh, take this beautiful image and, and put it out all over the place. This is uh, for a free download. And make the cry, stop lying to our children. Because the stop children lying to our children, children. exactly. Yeah. The children are going to say, what do they mean, Mom, that you, as Dad, that you're lying to us about what? So exactly on that point, leave it to the elders, is is that um, that that dominant society uh, refute. Uh, uh, despises the, the idea of us um, telling our kids their true history because it's more convenient um, to the dominant society to have us work with horse blinders made out of um, the, the fabric of, of you know the white supremacist history of, of this place can't put it any other way right so uh, we created this uh, coloring book um, that can be used for our uh, for parents to use as an educational tool with the children, right? Because at least our babies need to know and be proud of who they are. I present and a card book. And that is something city. which um, we we ask that you download as an educational tool uh, for a dollar. And it um, is is something that you know you can take to your fourth grade uh, teachers, uh, seventh grade teachers. Um, so that they can use these also as educational tools in the classroom. Um, and then there's going to be other really cool pieces that we'll be continuing to create. Um, but we don't know unless we try them, you know? And, and I operate off of the mentality that I can knock on nine doors and they'll say no, and I'm at ten when they're going to say yes. Uh, so um, we only fail by not trying. So. Um, and thank you all so much for your, your willingness and, you know, uh, being here to bear along with us. Um, if you have other platforms that you want us to uh, explore, uh, having conversations with folks here in, in San Antonio and beyond, uh, for mucho gusto. Um, and then we have uh, invitations for um, uh, an event that we have uh, this Friday night. Uh, this is the 25th year of operations of uh, American Indians in Texas and the Spanish Colonial Missions, uh, which is the nonprofit agency that was created by the Tepilam um, to uh, manage a lot of its outward community uh, pieces and, uh, you know, thanks to all of the hard work and sacrifices of our elders that we've been able to make it to 25 years and, and to the leadership of, of a woman keeping the ship above water. So um, uh, come eat with us, eat, drink, be merry. Um, it's uh, on a Friday evening at the Progreso Hall. Uh, invitations are in the back. Uh, we also have an Indian market that's going to be taking place on uh, Saturday the 14th at the Spanish Governor's Palace. We're going to take over the palace for the whole day. And um, there'll be music and food and drinks, vendors, performances, a free tree giveaway, an uh, early Texas history um, a project, uh, with these really beautiful photographs that we'll have out for display. And uh, that's free, family friendly, bring everybody, your cousins, your mom, your dad, good food, uh, of course. And then, um, and then we'll be uh, shutting down until January. Uh, we'll be um, 
getting the ground running, um, and uh, there will be more surprises there in store for everyone. Uh, please follow us on, on Facebook or Instagram. Um, leave your contact information, and we'll be sure to circle back around to you. Have a blessed evening. Thank you. We'll see you all later. Thank you all. Thank you.